I'll call the meeting to order. And we do have a quorum. Uh, first item, Teresa, I don't see approval of the minutes on here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's under the discussion. <laughs> sorry. Um, all right, so the next item here is a presentation from Nick, who is here with us tonight from Durham. And he's going to give us a, an informational presentation um, in terms of their roadmap and plans to meeting the new state um, requirement for zero emission buses. So I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? I don't need a microphone or anything, right? Okay. Good. Great. Um, well, my name is Nick Boisard. I'm Durham Senior Director of Electric Vehicles. I cover all of North America. So uh, I've, I've seen a lot. I've learned a lot. And I hope that I get to uh, bring some of that to light here. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I, I focus on more is electrification as a whole. I know that, you know, like you said, the, the state has a requirement to be, I think it's 2035, yeah. right? Um, and we'll work toward that. Um, there's certainly going to be some challenges uh, with that, but I think we all know that typically when states come up with unfunded mandates, uh, those things have uh, some you know, bigger challenges than what I can handle. But we will talk about how we plan to do that. All right, so this, this is the agenda for this evening, ED 101. I just want to go over a few things so that we're all kind of getting some, some basic information on um, the benefits and drawbacks of electric school buses uh, and some of the technology that's associated with electric school buses. Um, some information on the vehicles, range, and charging, um, federal and state funding, uh, and then we'll do some more challenges on ED implementation when it relates to uh, you know, getting things going on the site. And then we'll, we'll go through any questions you all have. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to interrupt me. I have uh, no problems with that. I enjoy the conversation. All right. Benefits of electric school buses. I think we all know that electric school buses have zero tailpipe emissions. So they are better for our environment. Uh, there have been studies that have been performed on school buses that illustrate the uh, fumes that are in the cabin uh, throughout the, the ride on a school bus. Um, I will preface by telling you that I'm 40 years old. I rode a school bus from kindergarten to 10th grade. Um, there were dirty diesel buses prior to you know emissions changes and everything else. And as far as I can tell, I'm fine. Um, maybe I should be 6'4". Yeah. I, don't <coughs> you know, I don't know what the challenges are there. So I, I know that there are um, certainly you know, emissions concerns. Um, however, it, it hasn't gotten to a point really where it seems like people are willing to pay the, the, the tab for what those emissions are. Um, we do know, again, lower overall greenhouse gas emissions. That's not just because of the zero tailpipe emissions. The actual manufacturing process of an electric school bus um, is cleaner than a regular school bus. I mean, we never get past um, you know, the fact that petroleum is in all plastics and you know, a lot of the products that we use on a daily basis and the vehicles that we operate. But there are fewer parts that go into the school bus. And those parts require less transport across the country. They require less manufacturing, thus re resulting in some lower greenhouse gas emissions in the overall uh, process of the vehicle. Uh, as it says here, the supply chain, as it gets cleaner, we get cleaner. That is related to the electricity. That relates, again, to the vehicle. Uh, as we get into, say, lean manufacturing and those types of things can make the vehicles cleaner. Uh, I believe firmly that school buses are the best use of electric vehicles. I think cars, it, it's still a ways off because of range, but garbage trucks, mail trucks, and school buses to me are the three best uses of electric vehicles. School buses in particular only because, again, we've, as we look at the, the opportunity for uh, vehicle to grid or vehicle to X, uh, being able to uh, utilize the vehicle in the summertime when it's not normally operating as a backup battery system or to put power back onto the grid um, as well as <clears throat> as well as on certain holidays and other other times of the year is a great opportunity um, there's also opportunities for in the event of an emergency where your cafeteria or your gymnasium are being used as a shelter and there's no power if you set up your building appropriately you can actually use the buses to power your necessary equipment within those buildings. Lower cost of maintenance, again, fewer parts. Uh, regenerative brake braking uh, requires less brake maintenance. It's another you know, piece. Uh, the the drivetrain is a very simple machine in, in more or less terms. And it, 
everyone here understands it's like the giant remote control car, right? Um, and, and the really neat thing is that that motor itself is pretty much bulletproof. I mean, it's the same things just shrink down that are used in like Hoover Dam. I mean, they're they're really really robust. Um, so you have you have um, a really great you know powertrain. Um, the OEMs are obviously you know in, in on board with getting this off the ground, so they're offering longer warranties, um, lower cost of fuel. Um, and again, they will get cheaper as we get into different alternative fuels for our power, whether it's solar, wind, uh, wave power, or whatever they end up coming up with. Um, as those technologies become cheaper, the cost of the energy gets cheaper, uh, thus saving more money. And finally, safety. Um, you know, Durham School Services is a leader in safety across the country. It's the forefront of everything we do. Um, these vehicles have very heavy weight in between the frame rails below the body of the bus. Um, that's the batteries. And because of that, there's less sway, there's less yaw in the vehicle. It turns and things like that, which offer a more stable ride. Um, regen braking promotes better driving habits, makes our drivers keep a better distance away so the vehicle can slow down and repower because we grade them on that, we coach them on that. Um, and it's quieter. So the students on the bus are quieter, the driver's less distracted, it offers a better ride <coughs> on the bus. The drawbacks, the biggest one. They're expensive. Does anybody in here know how expensive an electric school bus is? Over three hundred thousand. Over three hundred thousand, between three hundred and thirty to four hundred thousand dollars, depending on the manufacturer, um, and that's just the bus. The bigger issue that we run into is the infrastructure. The cost of infrastructure ranges dramatically. I could go out tomorrow to Amazon and I could buy an AC charger that would charge a school bus very, very slowly and it would cost about 500 bucks and it'd take about five days to charge the vehicle, okay? Um, or I could go to what we were talking about before with transit vehicles, where they charge with those big overhead gantries that push 350 kilowatts in 10 minutes, and that costs about a million dollars. So there's a big range there. Now, electric school buses don't, don't do that. They won't go that high. They'll go to about 50 kilowatts. Uh, those types of chargers range around 40 to $50,000 just in the charger. And a good rule of thumb with the construction on these is, is that it's the charger itself is about 40% of the overall construction cost when you're trenching a line, putting in utilities, and all the other things you have to do with regard to putting in the electric infrastructure. Sound exciting yet? It's, I'm seeing a lot of open mouths here, so I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm uh, communicating this okay. Does each bus need its own charger? <clears throat> yes. That's the other thing. So it's a one-to-one. -one. Um, when you're looking at, now there are chargers that offer two ports and it's one charger, but it's still a one-to-one. -one. You have to have one plug per bus. So, you know, today I could put a 10,000 gallon diesel tank on a site, I could fill 50 buses in, you know, 10 minutes a piece and be on my merry way in, in a day. Not a problem. With this, I have to have every single charger, or every single bus has to have a charger, and it can take, depending on the size of the charger, anywhere from three hours to eight hours to charge that vehicle. Um, that, that's, again, one of the reasons why it's a benefit for electric buses because you have overnight to charge. If you have short routes, which you all do, and you can run that bus a.m. and p.m. without any midday charge, you can plug it in at nighttime, it'll be fully juiced in the morning, you can go out and do its business and charge overnight again. And that cycle can continue without much issue, but it's still expensive to get there. Um, there's obviously the needs of the utility, uh, needs of a facility, um, you know, the, the challenges that we run into in certain school districts with their lots or owner lots that we lease is, is that we have you know, very challenging uh, spaces. Um, so the buses are parked in tight, we've got to rearrange the parking, we have to put in a parking island. As you can see here in this picture on the side, the equipment does have, um, you know, it's, it's quite uh, space consuming. So it's something that we have to take into consideration. And this, this implementation here that you're seeing in this image is like the gold standard. You can do other things. There are other solutions that don't look as pretty as this, but still get the job done. Um, but, but certainly, it still takes some, some real estate to do so. Um, again, this is a new technology, so there are some maintenance challenges that we don't know yet. Um, we believe that you know, today when we do our maintenance on our vehicles, it's about a 1 to 30 ratio, one mechanic per 30 vehicles, and that's what our typical rule of thumb is based on the fleet age. We believe that once we get to a fully electric fleet, we can get that up to between 1 to 50 to 1 to 75, uh, and in places like uh, like Stratford, where we have high density with Milford and other customers, 
we might even be able to do more with regard to sharing mechanics, having one mechanic who's more of an IT specialist, because these are, in a lot of ways, giant computers on wheels. Um, training is still new. Uh, we're working with manufacturers on training modules. Um, again, electricity costs vary there. I don't know much about Connecticut, but in some areas there's peak and off-peak billing. Uh, rates are higher during the peak moments when people are already in their air conditioners, lower when they're not, say overnight, things of that nature. Um, and then the last piece here, range anxiety, anxiety as a whole from our drivers. Did the vehicle charge? You know, we can plug it in, but if that handshake doesn't occur and the vehicle isn't talking to the charger, it will not charge. Now we have technology, we have what's called a charge management software that allows us to see a dashboard with all of our vehicles so we can see that, but it's still something that, that can be a uh, cause for anxiety. Um, today we also train our drivers that they need to fill that bus back up when it gets to a half a tank. Most of these routes now with electric vehicles, we're, we're challenging them to get to uh, what's called 20% state of charge. So you know, driving that bus down to where it's almost empty. And it's a, it's a big you know, change for them. And they're looking at that and saying that the range is a concern. I'll, I'll give you an example. I took an electric bus. So White Plains School District has five electric buses. I did a demo uh, for some clean energy program down at Union Square in, or Union Park in New York City. It's a 25 mile drive, but it's a 25 mile drive from White Plains to downtown New York. Um, and the vehicle goes 65 miles. I go down, I come up, should be 50 miles. I even had in my plan to stop at the Bronx Zoo where they had some chargers, plug in the bus, walk the zoo, charge it up a little bit, make my way home. I get to the Bronx Zoo, all three chargers are broken. <laughs> when I pulled into the lot, in White Plains, it was telling me two miles of range left on the bus. <laughs> so it was, it was. I mean, you're just sweat bullets. You know, you're saying, "Am I going to make it? Am I going to make it?" You know, it was, uh, it was really, really stressful. So I, I feel for drivers in that. So the um, question on that now, you run out of gas, you call your buddy, say, "Joe, come on, maybe gas it." Thank you, gas. You dump it in, maybe a little bit of carburetor, whatever. Fire it up, puffy up. Carburetor. <laughs> whatever, maybe. Actually, I had to do that with a kid who's. Corvette had a carburetor about a month ago, but anyway, um, electric bus runs out of gas and runs out of juice on the side of the road. You don't call your buddy with a tank of gas. You don't. So and one of the things that we as a company have to invest in, especially again where we have the density, is a service truck with basically a big jump battery on the back. So you think about when a car dies, we have these little jump boxes we can use to jump you know, the batteries. Think about a big one of those, say, again, you know, 200 kilowatts on the back of the truck. We pull up, juice it up you know, to get it next 10, 15 miles, and then let it go on its way. How, or we have to tow it. How big of a truck, <coughs> how, how big of a unit, you said 200 kilowatt, That would the charger? That, that would be about about 1,500 pounds. So it's it's gonna take an like F450 or something to you know, put it back. And it takes up the whole bag, so that's right. solely, right. that's all that truck does. Yeah. yeah. So, so traffic has an effect clearly on it. It does. Um, stop and go, obviously. So, is, is there a, a difference of you know going uphill, downhill, and does that make a, a big difference in it? Does the stop and go? Yes. I mean, so, buses so stop you, and go. Re, re, regen braking obviously is a great benefit for school buses because you're stopping and instead of using the brakes. As long as you're slowing down, the regen brake system is using the brakes to make kinetic energy to put back into the batteries. Um, but if you're sitting in traffic and you're not moving and you're still using all your auxiliary systems, your air conditioning, your heat, everything else, you're pulling power and you're not doing anything, that could be a challenge. Um, so, and, and it's not one-to-one, -one, right? So if you take it up the hill and then you go back down the other side, you're not putting as much energy back in as you used, but it still does give you some benefits. <clears throat> um, so just basic stuff on kilowatts. I say kilowatts and kilowatt hours, so it's similar to miles, miles per hour. Um, you know, kilowatts is the, the, the rate of electricity, and kilowatts per hour is how much you can get into the vehicle in an hour, how much it discharges in that hour. Um, so the power of school buses. We do it, again, it's you know, based on kilowatts per mile, so you see this 1.2 to 1.8. So the, the example here, um, IC has a bus that has a 315 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, for reference, a 315 kilowatt hour battery is like eight houses uh, a day, around, you know, around eight houses a day. So if you're talking about putting you know, 50 of these things on a site, or 100, I mean, you're, you've got a hospital, 
you, you've got a very large amount of power in a small space. So that again gets back to what our challenges are when it comes to our infrastructure side of things. Um, but I see claims that their 315 kilowatt hour battery can go 200 miles. This is their math. Um, you know, in, in the example you see, it says, okay, if every average rock is 37 miles each AM PM, you've got plenty of juice left over. The problem is that you have auxiliary systems. Again, climate affects range. You know, your climates are fairly mild most of the year, right? I mean, you get, obviously, your cold winters and maybe a few hot days in the summer, but most of the time, I would assume it's fairly mild around here. Um, so it's not going to be as big of an issue. Um, you have to deal with two different types of, of power draw. One is those auxiliary systems, your AC and your heat. You also have to deal with BMS system, which is battery, it's BTMS actually, battery thermal management system, which is what keeps the battery happy. These things need to stay at optimal temperature to give you the best, uh, the best performance and also prevent any you know, issues. Uh, we talked about region braking. Um, you know, midday downtime could offer what's called an opportunity charge. If your routes are long, you may have to charge sometime in the middle of the day to do the PM route. Um, it's certainly an opportunity. But here's, here's the best way I can provide you with how this kind of lays out here. Hopefully this works. Okay. So these are four of the main manufacturers of school buses today. Uh, Lion is an all-electric manufacturer. They've been on the scene for about uh, six years with an all-electric. They did have a diesel years ago, but um, they're all-electric. Uh, Thomas, IC, Bluebird are the big three that have been around for a you know, very, very long time. But you can see here, we'll just use the Lion as an example. So they claim, again, 168 kilowatt hours, that their range is 125 miles. The problem is, is that all these manufacturers, wanting the battery to stay healthy and to last a long time, they say, well, we don't want you to charge it more than 87.5%. Some say 90, some say 85, so I just did 87.5% in the middle. We want a little bit of space in that battery so you're not overcharging it and damaging the battery. Secondly, we don't want you to go lower than a minimum state of charge on that battery of 20%. So, when you start taking those numbers out of there, you come down to here and you say, well, they said 125 miles. Well, now it's only 84 miles. Well, that's a big difference when it comes to how, you know, how far I have to go today on my routes. Now let's talk about temperature. If I've got to go um, in 20 degree temperature or 90 degree temperature, now that performance goes down based on those auxiliary systems coming into play. And now my range can be even lower than that. So there's, there's, some, there's some miscommunication out there from the OEMs. It's really frustrating for me. Um, I think it misrepresents the, the, the opportunity out here, which I mean, we, we all want this to happen, but we really need to be honest about it so that people don't get hoodwinked into something that they you know, can't operate. Um, but I just want, I like to illustrate this and, and we'll you know, let you all have the presentation afterwards so that you can see that there's, there's some claims out there that really need to be addressed when you're looking at electrifying your fleet. Oh, I messed it up here. Sorry about that. Give me a moment. Okay. Um, the three basic types of chargers, as I mentioned before, um, you can plug these things into a household outlet if you want to, but it's going to take a very, very long time. Um, you're just not pulling enough power. Um, the, the time that I had to use the, the Amazon charger, I was pulling 9.6 kilowatts per hour, and it took me a day and a half to charge that bus from 42% to 85%. Um, level 2 chargers are the ones you typically see around your community. Um, the cars will put, plug into. Uh, they can range anywhere from 7. Uh, Five all the way up to 19.2 uh, on their charging ability. And then you get into level three chargers. Uh, level three are the ones that, that cost the most, but they offer the most juice. Uh, they're direct, uh, direct current, so uh, direct current, alternating current. I don't know if everybody in here understands the difference between those two. Um, the best way I can describe it is alternating current is what's in your house, and if you stick your finger in the socket and you can pull your hand off, that's because it's alternating. It gives you that opportunity not to uh, fry yourself. Whereas direct current um, is what they you know, use for uh, executions, unfortunately. Um, and it's, it's going to never let you pull off, and it's unfortunately going to be very dramatic. Um, so the direct current comes into the batteries much, much faster, um, and, and these chargers can range anywhere from uh, <coughs> 19, uh, 20 kilowatts all the way up to 350 kilowatts, uh, and they can charge very quickly. Um, and, and can offer um, you know, that capability. But again, 
the biggest issue with these can be heat. Um, you know, again, you have to manage these batteries. You can only push so much, so, uh, um, or you can really damage the batteries. Um, programs, I think everybody here has probably at some point in time heard of the US EPA's Clean School Bus Program. The US government provided $5 billion to be released over five years for the electrification of school buses. Um, it's, it's a big number. $5 billion is a very big number. Um, but $5 billion is what I would need to electrify all of Durham's buses. We operate about 20,000 buses across the United States, and it would take care of a bit of that $5 billion to purchase vehicles um, based on the current cost of the, the vehicles and infrastructure today. Um, there are some other programs that are out there um, with uh, you know, the uh, IRA, as you can see here. Um, the challenge again becomes we, we have the opportunity to, to piece different things together working with say National Grid or a utility, uh, working with uh, the federal funds and even potentially some state funds or, or those to, to maybe make um, something that's going to potentially uh, offset those costs and make a net, a net cost versus diesel. Um, but right now it, it is a little bit of a challenge. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Getting back to the challenges, and uh, I, I promise you I'm not a naysayer. I just, I want everybody to understand that there's a lot that goes into this. And frankly, we've, we've addressed all these issues. I mean, these are things that we talk about all the time. I'm showing you more or less so you know I'm valued in my job, I guess. <laughs> it's, but it's the point that there's a lot to think about because we want to do it the right way. Um, the cost is a big challenge. Um, we know that. We work toward getting to a cost parity before we really would present anything to a district. So if you said tomorrow you wanted to look at electrifying your fleet, we would sit down, we would do the analysis on the site, we would put a proposal in front of you that would illustrate what it would look like if you had to pay the full price versus what it would look like if we were able to find grants and the time it takes to, to do that. Uh, real estate, um, I'll be completely honest with you, I have not been to your site, so I don't know exactly how it lays out. Um, but the biggest issues we run into are, again, site parkability. And in many cases, in rural areas, we have what are called parkouts, where we let the drivers take the bus home. So they park it at home. Uh, I'm not going to be able to put a charger in someone's house. Uh, I could, but I'd have to separately meter it. And if they left, then I have a bigger issue. Um, infrastructure, we talked about that. Um, I, I believe here you have fairly decent grid stability. There are other areas of the country where that's not the case. Um, and then obviously power availability, getting the power to the site can be a challenge. I had a customer in Iowa who wanted to electrify their site and they were 10 miles, their bus barn was 10 miles outside of the, the, the city. And in order to run the power out there, we would have had to have had the utility run 10 miles worth of cable and they weren't gonna do it. So um, those things can be a challenge. Um, again, the contract terms, we would certainly have to look at our contract with you and present something that made fiscal sense for the district before we would move forward with anything. Um, and then, you know, certainly break down the costs from there. Um, we talked about range anxiety. Now, the other thing to consider here is in, in the event of a driver shortage, which God willing and God, you know, those, are, those are always happening, um, you deal with designing routes specifically made for electric school bus. I buy the school bus and I say, hey, it's this size, it can go this far. And I design my route, or if it works on the route, that's great. But it's more difficult for me to have my dispatcher double up a route. You missed Johnny at a stop. You gotta circle back and get Johnny. Well, the driver does that without thinking, and now there's not enough range in the bus either to get back to the school, or maybe it's a day <coughs> back to the school, but they don't have enough power to get through the PM route and not enough time in the middle of the day to recharge that battery. So there are a lot of things that have to be considered on the route design. Um, and we take great care of that. We look at a lot of those things. We train our management staff to, to ensure that that's not going to be the challenge. Plus, you have to remember, we're not doing everybody's depot 100% on day one. Anyone who's looking at this, we're suggesting 10% of your fleet at most at first. Because at least at that point, if the way we operate is we have a 10% spare ratio of our vehicles. If for some reason the electric vehicles aren't working, I should have a 10% spare of diesel buses that can operate in their place until such time as I can get them back up and running. Um, the maintenance challenges, again, we have mechanics that, uh, there's two issues. One, they're afraid of high voltage. Even though there's lockout, tagout programs, they have a real fear of that, that power and what it could do to them. Um, secondly, and this gets back to your comment about you know, working on a Corvette with a carburetor, right? Mechanics 
got into this business because they like to work on engines. And I have just taken that away. And I have told them that they're not going to have to maintain their favorite part of the bus, but they're still going to have to replace light bulbs, change seat backs, fix you know, little tinkery stuff around the vehicle. And while it's not as intensive for them, it's something they like to do. We've run into that, and it's a big challenge for them. Um, we've taken a lot of steps on safety measures, a lot of steps to make sure that everybody um, is not going to have any issues when dealing with these vehicles. Um, there are quality issues still, as this is a new technology. Uh, some of the manufacturers have had a couple different issues with their vehicles. Um, the big one that, that people uh, seem to gravitate toward on this slide is thermal events. Um, I think you all are probably a little closer to that than most, considering that there was a thermal event on a new flyer transit bus a few months ago uh, in this state, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the, the fear on thermal events is, is that they are very dangerous. They are very real. These buses go fast um, and very hot. What are thermal events? Uh, it's fire. Oh. Fire. Sorry. Bus fire. Sorry. <laughs> Fancy word. I just, you know, um, I guess I should just put there's a fire. Uh, so interesting with, um, with buses. So the, uh, the good and the bad. The good is that thermal events fires nine times out of ten happen at the point of charge. So they will happen at the depot when there's nobody around. Um, bad thing is is that they will happen at the depot when nobody is around and it will take everything with it. They are very intense fires. Um, the only other time they have those events is if there's a major accident and the battery is impacted and then you're dealing with you know, emergency services and everything else at that point too. But the thermal event on an electric bus is different than an ICE vehicle in that um, an ICE vehicle is a fire. A thermal event has two phases. It's called thermal runaway and it's a chemical reaction in the batteries. The chemical reaction starts and you cannot stop it. So once it starts doing its thing, it's going to continue to get warmer, 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 and then the first thing that happens is, is that there's a breach in the battery pack. The breach in the battery pack is where the uh, gases that are, or the, the, the fluids that are in the battery turn into gas and they burst. Um, and they're very dangerous gases. Um, hydrogen cyanide um, is one of the things I've heard thrown around there. There's a lot of really gnarly things that are used in those liquids in those batteries. Um, what will happen is that will release and um, as long as it doesn't accumulate anywhere, it just releases into the air. It's not great, um, but that's the best case scenario in that, that point. If it releases and let's say it gathers in the cabin of the bus, it is flammable and it will ignite when the batteries ignite and it will explode. Um, so it can be, again, very violent. I'm, I'm sorry, this is just the truth. Um, and then the second part of it is the actual fire the thermal event. The batteries catch fire, it burns very hot, um, it'll melt metal, it, it's like white hot, and it goes very quickly. Um, but, again, the, the two benefits of this are there have not been any battery fires on electric school buses yet to date. Um, there have only been two bus fires in the last year um, on transit buses. One was in Connecticut, the new flyer and the other was in Columbus, Ohio, and it was also a new flyer. And those were both caused because the manufacturer failed to put the proper uh, pump on the coolant system. And all those batteries were located on the top of the bus, the coolant pump was at the bottom, and it didn't have enough power to get the fluids up to the top, the batteries heated up, and they caught fire. Sounds like our HVAC systems. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, so that's obviously, um, <coughs> one of the big concerns, but again, like I said, um, they don't happen with kids on the bus. So. so, so one thermal event can take out your whole fleet. Basically. It it certainly could. It, it certainly could. Um, if you and uh, if you look at some YouTube videos, you can see uh, there was a battery fire in Germany last year. Uh, these big double decker coaches, and there's just six of them sitting in a row. I mean, it cooked these things. It cooked them real good. Um, so, so there there's an issue with that, and you can't stop them. So Johnny's hitchhiking the next day. Yeah. I mean, the biggest issue is, is that even if the fire department is <coughs> called, um, they can suppress the fire, but the bus will reignite. Mm -hmm. The chemical reaction will continue until all of the chemical fuel is expended. So that's why when like a Tesla gets in an accident and catches fire, they take it to a junkyard, they put it in a moat, and they let it sit for a month and just let it cook because it's going to continue to just ignite until all those batteries have expelled their fuel. 
So one one thermal event kind of offsets all your environmental savings. Uh, a little bit, yes. It, it's going to look not to sound terrible because I live near there, East Palestine, Ohio. Uh, but I mean, it's it's going to be it's going to be a pretty pretty serious event. Uh, questions. Good questions. So. You have one? I just I saw use like what's what's kind of the shelf life of one of these buses? How long do they last? Right now, the manufacturers are saying between ten and fifteen years. So that's a pretty big gap. Um, and he, here's how here's how it's designed. So the school bus itself today, um, with a good diesel engine, I'll say a Cummins engine probably is the best one, will out will um, will run easily for fifteen years. The body will rust out before the engine. Similarly, on an electric vehicle, the drivetrain motor itself will last far longer than the bus. If I could take those things and I could just replace them as I go along, that, that particular motor will last a very, very long time. Um, again, they're using industrial applications that run for 100 years and they, they, they don't go away. The batteries, however, are, uh, they vary in, in range based on the use. So, Think of it this way, it's, I give you a gallon of water, and it's, if you, if you drink it, you drink it. If you pour it out, you pour it out. Either way, you get one gallon. So there's a million kilowatt hours of power on a battery, whether you are discharging it, you're filling it up. So whether you're using it for V to G, or you're using it to operate, whatever the case may be, the discharge cycle of that battery is a million kilowatt hours. So when that million's up, it's done. So it could last 10 years, could last 15 years, depending on how robust you use, you know, how robust your operations are. Um, but they are, I mean, they're, they really truly do have some great features to them. Uh, I know that a lot of the things I go over do have you know, the challenges highlighted, but they're challenges that we can overcome. So again, the real estate piece is not insurmountable. The infrastructure piece is not insurmountable. Um, we obviously have a good partnership that shouldn't be much of a challenge. Um, teaching our drivers how to drive and dealing with range anxiety and coaching people on the best way to operate them, not a challenge. We operate electric school buses today and they do just fine. Um, we don't have issues with them. We've had some mechanical issues with them, um, specifically the Lion, um, and it's not a knock on Lion. Lion built a brand new bus from the ground up. It's a great bus because they actually use composite body parts uh, so it doesn't rust, which is really great, um, but their parts are hard to get right now. You know, they're a small manufacturer. Uh, they run into some little issues with, say, a door handle or something else that we wouldn't otherwise get from a Thomas or a Bluebird. Yes? So what's the plan, Nick? Like, what does the <laughs> next few years look like get for, right into it, for yes. districts? Like, what's, what should we be expecting? <coughs> what kind of transition are we going to be seeing? Like, as a company, we've set a goal similar to what Connecticut has. We want to be zero emission by 2035. Um, so we know that based on the replacement cycle of our vehicles that we really need to be um, in, a, in a situation where we're at 100% electric vehicle replacement within the next five years. Um, and, and that's just that we're no longer buying diesel buses. Every replacement vehicle we put into a facility is electric. Um, the same would be said for what we would do here is that we would look at your current vehicle life cycle replacement, and we would put a recommendation forward to say, well, here's the number of vehicles we have to replace next year, the year after, the year after, we would like to electrify based on that. Uh, again, if cost wasn't an issue, that's a very easy proposition. Um, but what we'll do is we'll have to put together something that shows you that, that scenario, and what that looks like from a cost standpoint. And it's built with a caveat of, here's what it costs today if you're paying for it out of pocket and you know, we'll go out, we'll pursue grants, and we'll do everything we can to get you know, as much as we can to offset those costs. If we are successful, the cost obviously goes down. Um, until the state comes to the table and says, well, we've increased the gas tax, or we've done this, or whatever it is, to provide this amount of money to pay for these vehicles, um, the only thing we have is the federal government's dollars. And that program is going to, uh, it's going to go away pretty quickly. Now, whether or not they come up with another one after that, I don't know. Um, I think it depends on the, the overall administration in a few years as to where that goes. Um, but you know, it's it's certainly um, it's certainly going to be interesting. There was a lot of interest in the first round. 
So for districts like ours, because I don't believe we own our buses, right? Like we basically rent them on a daily right. basis. What does that look like for our kind of district? Is it just a matter of, well, here's how your costs played out, you know, as you transition, here's what you have to charge us? Um, yeah, so, so the best way I can describe it is, um, you're on a cost per bus per day, mm -hmm. and let's just say that your rate's $300 per bus per day. Mm -hmm. To electrify a bus and the infrastructure costs that were all on me would probably be another $300 to $350 per bus per day. And it's just me amortizing that vehicle, which is, again, a regular school bus is less than $100,000. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm almost almost 4x if I get to the $400,000 mark on the cost of that vehicle. That's a very, very big barrier. But does any of those, I'm sorry guys, please do popcorn no, question. question. Does any yeah. of those billions of federal funding help to offset that increase and so that it's not a, a direct one-to-one, -one, you know, doubling of the, the cost? If, if we get funds, yes, yeah. we would absolutely do that. So for example, Blackstone Valley, Rhode Island Prep Academy, which is in Cumberland, um, they were one of the recipients for us mm -hmm. that received the grant. Um, so we got up to $375 per bus uh, plus $20,000 uh, per charger. Um, unfortunately, the $20,000 doesn't cover the full cost of doing all that infrastructure, but there is savings. So in that case, we, the bus is free. We were able to find a bus that does their routes that's at $360,000. So we didn't use all the money and we got a free bus. So it might cost to you today, let's say your rate is $350 per bus per day. $50 of that is my cost to amortize a vehicle, a diesel vehicle today. So if I got an electric vehicle for free, you would actually see a cost savings because I would be reduced by that. Net any additional infrastructure costs that I have to amortize. But there could potentially be savings. Um, we just haven't gotten to a point yet where about $175,000 to $200,000, if we can get the cost down to that number, that's where we reach cost parity against a diesel bus. And so those grants would make more sense to come to your company, not like school districts get grants to offset the potential increase that they would have to pay, right? We'll do it any way it works. Okay. Any way do you it works, know of any thoughts or thinking that there might be such opportunities? In, it's okay. In, in Connecticut, no. Um, I know there are some different organizations uh, like WRI, which is World Research Institute, that's looking at some different pilot programs that could offer some opportunities. Um, but you still have to apply. You have to you know, show your use case. You have to provide really, I mean, something that tells them that you're well suited for it. And in a lot of those cases, they're still looking at priority districts, you know, impoverished districts with different groups of people. Um, and I don't know much about Stratford, so for, excuse me, I don't know if you fit that or not. I really don't. Um, but I don't. I don't think you do. I don't think you hit the poverty uh, requirement on the EPA program, or I would have contacted you because um, it's based on the uh, S A I F E some poverty index or something like that. Is what they're using for priority districts. Um, and I, I would guess most of our lower income neighborhoods are are, are walking districts. A lot of I, I don't know exactly where the routes go, but mm -hmm. I know where things Franklin. When we look at a lot of the a lot of the kids in Frank at Franklin School, and I don't know if they're low income or not, but they walk to school, and I would guess the same as in Johnson. A lot of those kids do they walk to school every day. So you know, you, in an area like that, I don't know that busing would be as, as needed, and, and that would contribute to our our equation. Right. You know? I don't know. And, and, and it's going to be the district overall. It's not. Gonna yeah. be, they're not going to be looking at school by school. Mm -hmm. And and the and the problem. I mean, the, not the problem. The the program is going to change. So the first round, the EPA really wanted to go big. They wanted to show a, a big number. They wanted to show a lot of interest. So what they did is they made it a rebate program with very simple requirements. If you were a priority district, actually anybody could apply. And it was supposedly a lottery system, right? So they. They put out $500 million. Um, at the end of the day, they actually increased it to a billion based on the number of applications they received. They received $4 billion worth of applications. The problem is, is that they received $4 billion worth of applications from people who didn't otherwise need an electric school bus or know what to do with an electric school bus. So I have a feeling that some of those funds are going to come back. Um, as an example, there's a school district. We are, one of our customers is Boise, Idaho. There's a school district north of Boise about two hours 
They run 12 routes. They receive 10 buses from the EPA Clean School Bus Rebate Program. Their routes are 80 miles long a piece. They're rural. Their bus garage, again, is like I said before, it's, it's out in the middle of nowhere. So getting power to it is going to be a challenge. They had no business applying for it. But they saw free school bus. And they thought, let's go for it. Um, the next round is going to be a grant-based application, which means you're going to have to illustrate why you deserve to get the funds. And I think we're going to have a much better opportunity to prove to uh, the EPA why we are the best suited for it, um, both as a company who's looking to electrify as a whole and our responsible uh, you know, rolling out of these vehicles, and also meeting with customers, understanding their wants and needs, and actually having a true conversation as to why they want to electrify. So as a company, um, you guys are nationwide? Yes. OK. Yes. And how many buses do you guys? We, we have around 20,000 school buses on the road today, 30 states and three Canadian provinces. OK. And so, and I don't know if you know this, but in a, in a town like Stratford, where we contract, I'm assuming we have a, and is it, was it up in Lordship with the, the school buses? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So the, so the buses park up in Lordship, which is not far from here. Uh, but when you have another town like Milford, who's the next town over, they contract. I'm sure they have a spot where they park there. But we're not, we're not a uh, county. We're, we're statewide. There's 169 towns mm -hmm. in Stratford, you know, plus, you know, parochial and private schools and whatever it may be. So, it, it, you know, for servicing, and, and, and I know you guys don't do the entire state because we go out to bid, and you guys have won the last few years. So there are other companies involved. Right. Wow, so just, you know, the, the makeup and, and, and cross-section and say we go with you guys this year because we're contracting with you and we electrify, and you guys get the electric buses, and next year you know, we can't afford you. And we go with, you know, Joe's bus service down the road, and he doesn't have electric buses, that it's, it, you know, so I don't know how that... that it's, it's, the, it's the same. We're, we're approaching it with the same... Uh, <coughs> process that we do with regular diesel bus. If I lose your service, I have to take my toys and go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, that means I have to redeploy them. Mm -hmm. So if I have to cascade an electric bus somewhere else, then I'm, yeah, that, that's where the uh, sunk cost, there's a sunk cost thing on here somewhere, down at the bottom there. You know, it's, it's it, in the event of those types of issues, whether it's we agree that, you know, we're just going to have to you know, be happy with whatever you know, cost we put in our infrastructure and move on. Uh, I have a landlord. It's not a district facility. I don't own the facility. So I have to work with my landlord to you know, figure out how I get out of that situation. Uh, and on top of it, my guess is that if we did that, we would certainly be looking to uh, you know, find another customer within the area to, to contract out with. So then the, the infrastructure piece, that would be incumbent upon us to provide that infrastructure because if we decide not to use you, then we don't want you taking up all your electric lines and you know going to Milford. Well, it depends. I mean, again, if it's if it's your facility, yeah, then I highly recommend that you do the infrastructure. If it's if it's a district facility, if it's if it's a facility I lease from a landlord, then that's a different story. You're not going to put money into something that's somebody else's property. Um, but if someone like First Student or STA, one of the other big ones, comes in, uh, they would absolutely build their own infrastructure and do their own thing. I can't say the same for like a DATCO or one of the other small mom and pops is what they would do. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, you're right. There would be, but again, if you, chances are that if you did what you, you're saying, um, you would get a call, get a price, and it's too high for you, and then you go with somebody else because you can't afford it. You're probably not getting electric buses the second time around. You're going back to uh, mm -hmm. an ICE vehicle. Well, and we see. negotiate contracts because they're not maybe necessarily can't afford it, but we can get a better deal. Right. You know, so. Um, and, and does that lock us into you know, higher rates because of the transition cost with if if it's not our infrastructure or you know whatever it might be or if we have to pay for the infrastructure there, there are grants I think you were saying a lot of these federal grants come to a company like yours not necessarily to a municipality and so so it, it gets messy it, it does get messy and and I'll tell you that. Um, there's two things. One, it's 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 all the cart. So if you want to have the infrastructure is, is your cost burden or the grant to go through to you for that or what have you, certainly we'll, we'll work through that. At the end of the day, um, my goal is to make it the easiest transition no matter what. I mean, look, 
I hope I never lose you as a customer. Mm. Per, I mean, that first and foremost, I hope that never happens. But in the event that it does, um, you know, we can work with you. Like for example, we are currently working with a company, an outside a third party electrification company, and they are going to own all of our all of our infrastructure and lease it to us. So if I have a contract with somebody else to do that, it would just be a matter of assigning that contract to you. Again, the only challenge being that it's my piece of property that I lease, not yours, and getting your infrastructure off of it, which you know, is an issue. And then just one, one last one. We, when you, you had equated, and I don't remember the bus, the number of buses to the equivalent of a hospital, how many buses would... would it, I was just, I mean, it's... it's Roughly, roughly one one electric school bus is eight houses. Okay. So it's roughly you know, 30, 30 kilowatts is about what a house runs. Yeah. So so when you're talking about a, a bus that's three hundred kilowatts, right? Thirty is ten, eight. You know, it's eighty. It's an 80, 80 house apartment, eighty room apartment at that point, or condo, or whatever you want. So I mean that that's really kind of how that's, we're saying. I don't know how many buses we run, but so but again going back to the hundred and sixty nine towns, each town decides to electrify. You know, I don't know that we as a state have the, the grid that you don't handle that. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you another. So it's like, do we like, do we like go in a lottery and say, all right, the first 10 who apply for this get electric buses and the rest of you don't because we don't have the electrical infrastructure to support anymore? The utilities are excited and scared all at the same time. I was at a meeting with National Grid several months ago in New York, and someone said, well, they heard that to electrify all of New York State's buses would be 8,000 megawatts of power. And Long Island is 4,000 megawatts. <coughs> so that should tell you. I, mean, I don't know how Long Island relates in the size to Connecticut, but that should give you a reference as to what we're dealing with. And it's going to be very challenging to get all of that power. But then if you're generating that much electricity, electricity is generated by fossil <laughs> fuels. <laughs> now your, your fossil fuel generation surpasses your diesel bus emissions at some point, maybe. No. It, it, it doesn't. So they're more efficient, all right? So the, the amount of power, to think of it this way. So a, a diesel, an ice engine lets off heat. Heat yeah. is energy that is not used, right? It's just there. Um, whereas with electricity, it's more efficient because it doesn't let off as much heat. The amount of power you get per, per whatever the scientific name is for it is, is a greater formula. So I think back here I had to t I think it says that it's, uh, where was it here? Uh, uh, right. One gallon of gas is approximately 33 kilowatt hours. So again, getting back to um, this, the bus being 300 kilowatt hours, that would tell me that 10 gallons of gas is a full tank, right? And so, I mean, it's, it's a pretty decent you know, comparison from that regard. It does get better. Um, Again, it gets cleaner as you go along if you're using hydropower or you're using wind power or something else, which is certainly up for consideration, or solar power. Um, but it is still overall cleaner for the environment because of the process of manufacture and the amount of the, the power it gets utilized. In the same term, too, the diesel gets cleaner and the, the fuel efficiency on those buses gets greater. Right. Probably not at the same level, but... You know, right. So. Exactly. Yes, sir. Thanks. Do you know what the accountability measures are if the system does not reach that goal? Which system? The uh, 2035 mandate uh, zero emissions. The, to, for 2035 to be fully functional. I, I have no idea. I does anybody they, know? The, the I know the legislature. Out there, but no, they, they, they have, I don't think they've they said what the punishment is. Yeah. So I have a less technical um, question. Earlier you said um, in the next five years all of your new buses would be electric. Maybe I misheard you. Would have to, it's so if, if I if I do the math mm -hmm. again, it's 2023, mm -hmm. and if I want to be uh, fully electric by 2035, mm -hmm. that's 12 years, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 12 years. So my typical replacement schedule for a vehicle is. 12 years on a, a large type C, eight years on a smaller type A. So on average, I have about that three to five year range mm -hmm. to fully transition my purchases to electric. Now, I know I'm not gonna get there, but my, my goal still is, is that I know that I have to be transitioning to being fully replacing electric by that time frame. And that's similar to what New York State said. They said by 2027, there will be no more 
diesel or you know ICE vehicle sales, it'll only be zero emission. Again, I I don't want to belittle any of that. I think it's a great initiative, but you're telling somebody to do something without giving them a way to pay for it. Nobody's going to do it. You cannot. Nobody in this room. I, I would I would be highly disappointed if anybody in this room made the decision to go out and buy electric buses without getting any additional funds from anybody for a couple of reasons. One, you're going to have to eliminate programs that you otherwise wouldn't eliminate your schools, and you don't want to do that ever, 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 ever. Two, the technology is getting better and it's getting cheaper. So to, to go out and, and spend the money now, you're you're going to be behind the curve. You're going to have, you know put your money in the place that you don't really want it for the next 15 years. So I mean, there, there's some things to consider um, with that, but I, I, I still, again, believe that it's the right decision. It's just we've got to have a good financial model for it. And so within um, that five-year period, districts won't be able to lease or um, basically contract your non-electric buses, right? No, we would still do that. The so, because what I'm trying to get at is, are we going to find a situation where districts, because of the cost being so expensive, fighting for your limited amount of diesel buses, right? Like, are we going to be in a, in a predicament there, and how is that going to impact us? Um, I will tell you that the big three, I see Bluebird and Thomas, are not stopping making ICE vehicles anytime soon. I, I don't see that happening. Um, just, just because until... Until they're getting um, the, the supply demand that's going to dictate um, them turning off those lines. Mm -hmm. my, my father said best. Here's the best thing I can tell you. When I told my dad um, that I was doing this job and that, you know, there was this big issue with people you know, worried about electric buses and transitioning over, he said, son, when they invented the automobile, they didn't go out and shoot all the horses. And I know it's <laughs> archaic. But it's the truth, you know. They didn't do that, so there will be there will be time, um, and it will it will happen. Um, but I think we're we're way far off from that because at the end of the day, there's still places like Hardin County, Tennessee, or um, Eastern Ohio, or wherever it is that are rural and have no need for electric bus work. The power just isn't there. They're going to have to have a way to continue to serve those those communities. So I don't I don't see it going. Either. Quick question. At present time, are all of the chargers and the cables that connect to the buses kind of universal? Yes. Or, okay. They all have the same J1772, that Chevy Bolts and Ford F-150s. We don't use the Tesla charger. We use a, the, the standard one. So. so to some extent, if the 2035 guidelines hold, there's kind of value in a municipality having ownership of its own infrastructure. There is. There, yeah, there is. And the thing is, is that you have to remember the infrastructure itself, um, the, char the chargers can be over the air updated. So they are a big computer that's just pulling power. They can be over the air updated. Everything else is the same technology that's been used for power for generations, right? The switch gear, the transformer, everything else on the other side of that line is the same equipment that's that's sitting in the basement of this building. Um, it's not going to change. It's just what it is. So, so you, you do get value in that, and it'll last a long time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Absolutely. Is that Very it? Very informative. Yeah, I think so. Hope I didn't scare anybody. A little bit. Oh, 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 this is a good one. And I think that's <laughs> great. Five seconds for my house. All right, so uh, moving along on the agenda, items for discussion and possible action. So just I, before, before we move on, Nick, yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, things will be changing. Legislation will be changing. Is, is there any way you guys can keep us updated Absolutely. on any any legislative changes, any any changes of your just so we can stay apprised and, and as new information becomes available? Maybe we can, I mean, I'm not sold yet, but right, you know. Um, so we're just abreast of what's going on, where it's going, and where it's heading. And, and a what absolutely, we we do uh, we do an internal EV newsletter. I can work with our government relations folks on making sure we're pushing out. Maybe you can get it over to Teresa, and she can forward it over to us. Thank you. Will you still put that in the way? Yes. 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 Yes.
Do you have specifics? Oh, that's yeah. Yeah. Well, it was kind of, you know, in the email. I mean, in the last month's meeting, I walked around and I handed everybody what's now been reissued tonight. Um, and I was also under the understanding that um, the people in this room wanted me to start kind of interacting with the Talent Building Needs Committee. Absolutely. So I didn't see either of those two items reflected in the minutes. So, so um, we, can, yes, please. Oh, we can make sure to um, update the minutes to, because we did discuss at the last meeting that since you're on the Building Needs Committee and you're here, that you would sort of bring us those updates and that I was gonna make um, an item, an ongoing item on the agenda, which I did for um, starting this month. Excellent. So it's so there to we'll cover that when we get there. So, yeah. so I would so make a motion to amend the minutes to reflect that Mr. Llewellyn will be our liaison with, with the uh, building needs. with the Towns Building Needs Committee and report back to us on a, on a monthly basis. I'll second that. Great, all in favor? Aye. 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 Ellen, I understood exactly what you said, the way you said it. When I read your message, it really confused me. But I understand what you're saying right now. Okay. It's funny, usually it's the opposite. Usually what I write is more easily understood than what I said. Now, Ellen, do you also want to amend that you distributed the... No, it's, it's fine. It's, it's out here again, and I, I think we all kind of see the, the direction we're going with it. Okay, so that's the only amendment. Yes, was... yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, next is the facilities report from Mr. Moore. Well, I think first you have to uh, oh. ask the people who made the motion if they agree with the amendment. So, so the, the okay. amendment was, I, I amended it, and I think I had a second. Yes. Yeah. So then we would need a, a yeah, vote on the amendment. The amendment. Yeah. Or we can call in favor amendment. of the amended motion. Aye. 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 And then we, and then we need to vote on the full yeah. acceptance of the minutes. Yeah. As amendment. Amendment. As amended. All yes. in favor of the uh, minutes as amended. Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. <laughs> it's a technicality. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right, so moving on to the facilities report. This month's a little late. <clears throat> I don't have a whole lot to go over with you. Um, April vacation of the town, who's going to be doing the boiler replacement at Nichols and Longship. A uh, company will be coming in to take all the anything asbestos on it. And Stuff like that, they'll come and they'll take all that off to get ready for the summer. So as soon as school's out, they jump right on it. Have they filed for that already? But yeah, Brian Schneider's already taken care of all that. I just know there's a <coughs> two week review period and yeah. what we have in the month of March. I don't usually, what Brian sends me that he has yes. an actual date, yeah. he's usually on top of it. Agreed. Right. Um, and again, um, last night the solar panels got approved for uh, Second Hill Lane and Worcester. So that's going to move forward this summer. There is going to be some flooring that's done at Johnson this summer, project-wise. I think there's sort of three significant projects at Bunnell, and I don't know if they're just going to do that kind of prep and make ready for next summer with those, but I thought there was more flooring in the auditorium. Yeah, there, was, <coughs> there was supposed to be the, uh, the flooring in the main office area, because that's been a big issue. Um, I have not heard yet whether it's a definite go or it's not, but I want to say I, I heard it is, but I have not got a complete. Yep. Even even yes, professionally, in, in my day job, there's several projects that have become multi-phased, where this summer will more like abatement, enabling work, some right. demo, some prep, and then we till next summer for materials. And they are going to be doing the um, pavement in but no, outside, and they also have. Uh, spoke with uh, John Casey. So they're going to be putting in a, if you come in from the firehouse and the property that's on the right, right at the top where the parking lot is, there's going to be like a little retention pond that they're going to put in there. And then right down along the property line in the driveway going down to uh, where the other pond is down there, mm -hmm. they call it a pond, uh, they're going to put two catch basins to divert water and then that'll get piped down to Connors, uh, John will say. Now, that stuff's supposed to start, the, the, pond, the retention pond up top by the firehouse, it's supposed to get started soon, I think in April. Um, but he didn't have, you know, he, he just kind of threw out a, a, a month, so we'll see how it goes. And, and that's more, it sounds like more an engineering project? It public works. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's not a building specific. It's not, no, no, it's not. It's just another, for them to divert water again, because it's such an issue sometimes yeah. over there. I just threw that in there because that's something that's going to be happening on there. And as soon as they're done with all theirs, 
then they're going to start repaying them a lot. Mm -hmm. So, quick question, um, and it's probably a non-issue, but it's just more like my brain trickle and double checking. You said there's going to be some work being done over the spring recess break. There's usually no. Um, student activity going on at our Correct. schools, there right? Because I just want to make sure, because there was that situation where... No, no, there won't be when it comes Great. to that. Great, okay. No, okay. No one will be allowed under okay. 18 So we're not going to hear, like, people showing no, no, up for no, a no. game yeah. and... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they do okay. too much I'm over at uh, Nichols or... No, the, yeah, to Rich's point, because there's going to be active work going on and construction workers and yeah. whatnot, Park and Rec would take those buildings out of the availability for okay. April break. And I would, okay. I would say yeah. that yeah. John Casey's already done that, and then yeah. he'll also get yeah. posted yeah. with no one yeah. at the agency. Just want to make sure that the communication, yeah. will that include the outside properties, too? Like the outside of the properties? No. Like, okay. But we wouldn't have them even near there. They're I mean, gonna, like the basketball courts and stuff that people are using. I don't see that's going to be an issue. Playgrounds. You know what I mean? Everything is contained down in the boiler room. It gets bagged, brought up, put in their containment that they have, and offsite it comes. And there's probably some sort of a containment yeah. process that's that what takes I mean. place yeah. prior to any removal. Yeah, yeah whatever, you know. Bags that they use, the container bags. But even just plastic wrapping, exactly. they make sure it doesn't escape out into the yeah. ball. And everybody will there. be suited up in there. Perfect. Yeah. You, you talked about uh, replacement flooring. Is this the second year of that or the first year of the replacement flooring? If no, so <coughs> they did flooring replacement. The main office area. There are some other areas that were talked about getting replaced. I'm not positive on where those are, but the main office has carpet in it, which is just coming up and popping up and becoming trip hazards. The town will come fix it, put it down, and tape it up if they can. But now, the last I heard that was going to happen this summer, but I don't have a positive from Brian Snyder yet, as if that is definitely in his book. Because I'm looking in. I know it's old, but the, uh, I'm looking at the Adopted Capital Improvement Program for 2020 through 2024. And the replacement flooring was supposed to be done in 22 and then in 23. That's out in hallways, classrooms, and stuff like that. Again, a lot of stuff at Benal kind of got put on the burner, so to speak, until it becomes a project to do everything carpet that was in there you know, was taken out and yeah. replaced with rubber floor mm -hmm. that was a project last summer that got you know that was taken care of but to go and replace all the hallways uh, I have not heard of that happen well that leads to my next question if we are seriously thinking about looking yeah. at the now and renovating it yeah. are any of these things mm -hmm. kind of wasted money mm -hmm. uh, at the time no that um, had to be done mm -hmm. because okay. of the carpet that was just coming up and you had asbestos tile and uh, mastic down so it had to it had to be done yeah um, again uh, none of that would be happening this summer as far as I know because by the time it goes to the state to get a reimbursement right. it's too late for that now you're probably looking at 2025 before that would end up happening to get all the paperwork into the state how long does it take to get, I mean, are we looking minimum, if we were to, or the Board of Ed was to decide in the town, to decide to renovate the now? I couldn't even tell you that right now. After just finishing high school, for that to go. Well, with that experience, how long did that take? Alan, Alan might have some sense. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of of Benel mm -hmm. and doing finishes and finish upgrades, especially to kind of the administrative areas, regardless of what happens in the future, I would see value in that. Yeah, Anytime we're taking advantage of an environmental opportunity to get asbestos out of our facilities, regardless of what they're called today, exactly. there's there's a value and an, and an enhancement to that. Um, but what the question was, how long for Stratford High School did it take for to like actual work go, to start yeah to go through the whole process so we started RFPs, in, uh, we started in earnest programming stratford high in 2014 um put the shovel in the ground for the classroom building um i want to say june july of 2017 and started 
the um, the civic side of the building that has the gymnasiums and the more civic rooms um, in 2019. So, so, so we started so back in 2006. I think we, yeah. we had Imagine approved some of the yeah. we had we had to approve the grant, so we. And, and so yeah, just, there was a prior grant that was a renovate as new in place, no kind of no new build. Ours was all well. We had looked at it because we did it. Well, it, it, we started we started way back in 2006, so it's, it can be a very take, long yeah, it, you know. and that's why I asked the the question because uh, you know again I'm looking at an old capital. I love that you're bringing that up because I know Alan gets very when he hears. <laughs> okay, I want to start the conversation around. Just, what we can do to either decide to go new or to renovate. I know we just finished the high school, but what would it take for us to begin those discussions or what do we need to wait on? So one of the, I was gonna bring this up later, but it's a good time to bring it up now. So one of the biggest helps that I had in terms of conceptualizing and figuring out steps in the process and what to do with Shaffer High School is that running in parallel was two towns over West Haven High School, going through a very similar process that we went through they actually had Antonazzi as an architect. Their design is not that dissimilar from ours. The big difference between us and them is they kind of did things opposite of what we did. They did their gymnasium, their auditorium, their big civic spaces first, and then did their classroom piece second. So to, to that end, I don't know if anybody's heard about this or not, but uh, just this week in Wallingford, they voted to consolidate Sheehan and Lyman High School. High schools. I actually was gonna bring that up. Yeah, so glad you did. Rough, rough numbers. Um, I'm seeing 1,500 students, 300,000 square feet, and a total cost of $216 million. So they went through a similar process as us, doing um, population studies, doing some of the other auxiliary studies. Um, if you want, I can scan it and get this article out to everybody you know, if we're interested. But I saw this kind of as an opportunity to look at a municipality not too far away from here mm -hmm. and kind of see how they're sort of starting to put together their process along the road of going to a single high school. And regardless of what we decide or what we do, to me this kind of made it less hit and miss, less right. guessing. Mm -hmm. That we can now see a format, see a plan, yeah. we don't have to follow it, but it makes it kind of less throwing darts at a board and more, Let you know. Let make it, all the mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 I don't want to say that West Haven made mistakes, but to some extent, it's what, it's what happened there. They had a discussion amongst you know, their municipality about whether or not to invest in kind of the industrial arts type buildings. And the mayor prior to, um, to Mrs. Rossi was of the opinion that he wasn't on board with putting that money and that amount of money into a post-millennial high school. And that's where kind of they got hung up, and then we ended up getting, you know, getting our act together and getting ourselves positioned ahead of them. Mm -hmm. But up until that point, we were sort of, they made a step, we made a step. They got through school facilities grant, we got through school facilities grant. They didn't go through special legislation, which, which we did, just because in our conversations with Crack and with the town, we saw that as the most effective way of, of using money because we really weren't fitting the remedy in place or the complete build is new. So, um, you know, and going with the special legislation, I haven't seen whether or not Wallingford's doing that, but having done that once, I would not fear going through that process again if it fits. I did see that they're getting a 43% uh, reimbursement from the state. Not that. So shouldn't we, based on what you're saying, 2006, or shouldn't we make it like a priority to start the conversations now well, for something? PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> you I, need I, a break. I've only, I mean, I've only been trying to say this since 2019. So, so, so it's, it's, it's good to have people listen. It was actually Alan O'Neill who brought the building needs, and we did a feasibility study of Stratford High and determined that the building was not solvable. You know, that was that was our first question. Can we salvage the building? Or is is the expense and there were two wings, an older wing or a newer wing, the, the older wing was one hundred percent gone so and the other wing maybe, but we came to the determination that it would need to be an entirely new school and then we started the process and then, and then as councils changed, but the ball kept getting passed on and it kept rolling, but until until the the real shovels in the ground it was a long process so probably 2006 was yeah. the kind of the discussions about how to fund it but then um, to actually kind of go through the steps and process and put a program in place 
that kind of that kind of came, came later. So I don't know what the current guidelines are either, really quick, out of school facilities, but over the last three years or so, I've managed to get into Bedell a few times here and there, and I've found ladders kind of set up, and I've gone up the ladders and looked above the ceiling and kind of gotten a feel for it. Right now, based on what I know, I would say that there are large portions of Bedell that are renovatable. It has higher floor to ceilings than Stratford High has, and I also believe the piping system of the infrastructure is run separately. Stratford High's infrastructure moves more run vertical and branched out, but now I understand is more run in loops. So question for both of you, the feasibility um, assessment that um, Brian Schneider had done for us, mm -hmm. would that suffice? Or do you, or when you said for Stratford High, there was a study that had to be done, would something else need to be done for Bunnell? Because his report is, Reno to yes, uh, was, is Reno to new or brand new? Which it's um, you're saying you've arrived at that same conclusion as well. So would we need to do like? <coughs> is there anything more to do? Is there anything is more to do there, or is that determination good enough to take another step? It might, it might be good enough to start. But, but yeah, I, I think if if we wanted, and again, we would probably need permission from the full board. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, what we wanted to find out when we did it is. is you know, what direction do we want to go and do we want to go in direction? Of course, if we could have easily renovated in Stratford High, that's where we'd want. But it just, it, so our, what well, the direction we gave, I can't remember whoever did the feasibility study was, is the school salvageable? And, and, or as part of it, and came back as no, and then we moved from there. If we decided that at some point we wanted to do something with Vanel, I think, I think some of those things are in there, but what is, what is salvageable, what's not, what are the, and then what are the, uh, what are the financial rewards if we renovate as new? Do we? I don't think we'll, the town will foot the bill for another rebuild, but or for a long time because yeah. we have still still issue. Issue. Exactly. Or, but yeah. or can it be steps. done in phases? Yeah. You know, yes. you know. Because it sounds like there's a lot of steps, right? right? So can we enter through some of those? So can we put as board as a subcommittee to the main board asking them if we have permission to do this next step, which would be. Um, a feasibility study well, so on whether it be is the it does say renovate to there. new yeah, yeah. which is out of the mind is your state grant reimbursement fund. exactly so we as a committee can say hey we did this right we mm -hmm. paid for the service to do this assessment here's the uh, conclusion we want to put it forward to the board but we would need to say which way we want to go right like we so, so I think as a board, we need to so, do a little more. Well, good. So, if we decide to look at what's in the Brian Spanner report, yeah. and then in terms of see feasibility of what we want Benel's future to be, the next sort of step would be to have Brian Spanner look at the feasibility assessment that he did in terms of how he would approach on the office of school facilities in, in Hartford. They had some very stringent size and space requirements for the gross lot of a school. That drives how many classrooms you can have, your total gross square footage, and then as you start cascading down from the gross square footage conversation, that then determines you know how many total classrooms, how many of each type of classroom. Um, you know, there's even certain sizes that are based on your Know your programming. If you have no art students or you have no ceramics program, they're not going to give you money to get those rooms out of thin air on the grounds that you might develop them. So, in order to do that, do we first need to determine if we want to recommend new or reno to new? Like, do we need to make that determination first? Well, somebody's got to go in and make a study. Right. We don't know that the roof can handle all kinds of yeah. equipment. Mm -hmm. We have a steam boiler system in there that needs to go. Mm -hmm. They're constantly That's what the study shows is that it's there's, really yeah, but that's what we paid for. Yeah, what they're actually looking to do. Oh yeah. But that's what we paid it's for. All covered. That was the that's study we paid right. for. So right. the recommendation was well, right. so he did a, a small assessment. We're talking about renovating high school. He went in there and pointed out A, B, and C. But you gotta what do we want? Do we want the it's school like, to look the same but just redo the interior well it does or, he's pretty detailed mm -hmm. but it's on the current condition the current operation correct 
So it, I think we almost have to go in at this at two ways at the same time. One, to go in, okay, we want to renovate. What what do we have to do to, to do that? Because it definitely needs renovation. Hey, Brian but, would be a good person to answer any of the questions right. we have. Maybe but we then can have we it can do it next month. month. Maybe we can do it. Maybe we can also. Sorry. Right. But then we can also look at your school projections, which were done during this committee's last mm -hmm. uh, configuration, to sit to start looking at the same time. Do we want to go to combining schools? Yeah. So you can. You, it's two tracks that you can uh, follow. Um, so that when we get to the point where Brian Schneider, when we see Brian Schneider, we can tell him, well, this is, you know, we're looking at two things, combining these schools and renovation. How do we go about uh, looking at that? So we're not spinning our wheels. Yeah. Um, You're making Rich nervous. He's shaking his shape. We're bringing the professionals. <laughs> <laughs> I always do it. <laughs> Well, you, I, you I already got that. one sports car. Don't you want another one? <laughs> I don't have one. You know, I think it was with uh, Honey Spot, if I if I don't remember if I remember correctly. It got to the point where it uh, it costs the same to renovate it than to build new. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it was the, the difference was minuscule. So mm -hmm. if you're going to look at it that way, build new is is the way to go. Now, Benel's a little bit different, uh, and it's a big decision for the town to say to go to one mm -hmm. high school. But if you read that article with Wallingford, they they did a lot of, of research and looking at it. It passed their board of ed five to one, six, six to yeah, one. five one or six one. Yeah, it, oh. it, they were pretty uh, adamant, and, <coughs> and their discussion in the article was that they were in, in favor of it. I think the one was against the price, if I, if I remember the article correctly. Now, Wallingford, we can go and talk to them about their process, just yes, like you did with Sabre. Can you send that out? Yeah, I'll scan it in and send it right has a question. The history of 2006, 2008, you might have been here, right? Alan, you were here. Why didn't we start with this? Right. Because why don't, very good question. Why don't we have one high school now that we invested in? Um, Did we I'll that? try to be delicate. <laughs> I will be. It's, it's <laughs> called politics. <laughs> it's, it's called politics. So now, I remember in the early 90s, the Board of Education agreed to go to one high school. The town council disapproved it. They said, no, we're not going to do it. And I think that decision that long ago has tainted mm -hmm. what we're doing. I mean, uh, one time a couple meetings ago, I brought it up and Mr. Carroll said, well, the South End won't go to the North End. <laughs> yeah, that Stratford versus the yeah. that's a fierce And I'm sorry, thing. I live in the South End. You know, if I'm going to go to a really good school, where I can um, learn and get a better education, I think that's a no-brainer. We're too small of a town to have such choice. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I mean, if we were a city, that would make sense. So, oh, I'm going to stay in this office. I'm going to go to the north end. We're a yeah. small town. Yeah. We allocate all resources mm -hmm. to a gem, academically, athletically. I mean, all of it just makes so much sense yeah, that I just whispered to Teresa and said, why are we having this conversation? 15 years after the fact. So one, one of my pressure points that sort of detoured myself and the group that I was working with from having the one high school conversation is we were hearing from multiple sources, including some up in Hartford, that the New England Secondary Schools Accreditation Association was in the process of putting Stratford High on a watch list where it would potentially lose its accreditation. And I don't think anybody ever wants to explain to 250 high school seniors why their diploma is not accredited. Rumor or you want to no? That's where you want to come to people that you yeah. know. <laughs> more solid than a rumor. Yeah, I would say it was more than a rumor, but uh, you couldn't so get anyone to say anything on the record. Right, but, but. It, it pushed the situation that we got to fix Stratford because we can't have graduates not 
uh, getting their certification. Okay, but now is almost there, I think, in, in condition. For, that the high school accreditation may come down and say, I don't know. Because of the physicality of the building? Yes. Or that's okay. Yeah. What's Just the, the physicality. Not in a double L class, double L school size. Oh, I don't know what the minimum is. And would we be above with that? If we combined, yeah. If we combined, we'd be, I'd be, we'd be, we'd be a double L. Yeah, would we would be people? above. I don't, no, I don't know how the double L there's, there's no There's no max. The double L is like the heavyweight division. Once you qualify, then you're in. There's no maximum number. But And I don't know what the qualifying student population is. Well, what are we now? Is. We're a hair under 2,000. 1,700, 1,800. Yeah, but no, I mean, are we what class? L in each? M no, in I think each? we're an M. Yeah. Are we an M and a double L? Or are we both in the same? L. I thought they were split. Alan, we're over 2,000. We're at like 2,200. Yeah. It is okay. Although I gotta say the projections, it's gonna be around eighteen hundred in five years. Yeah, right. So that too. Yeah. So I think we've done some of the research. It's a matter of continuing and following up. Maybe getting a few other answers that we don't have. So we'll make sure to invite Brian for next month's meeting. I, I think he would be a good start to help us kind of start navigating or maybe indicate to us who the who the next consultant Perfect. should be. I mean, and I would like to see us get on a path to start making some decisions. I feel like yeah. just these surveys that we do and we have done, they, they cost somewhere between twenty two to 40000 a pop. We're probably going to need seven or eight of them in order to go through this process and make this decision. Some of the student population information that we have is, is still usable. So before we end up having to redo everything, mm -hmm. I mean, again, let's, right. let's get going. So yeah, I would like to just add to that quote of the cost of these studies mm -hmm. in Sacred Heart University. Mm -hmm. um, undergraduate and graduate school business schools offer feasibility studies for close to nothing. So we should be looking and utilizing our neighborhood universities for opportunities that save money. That's a good idea. A lot of people have been asking that question that you just asked for a long time. Yeah. As a parent who wasn't a parent in those early days and going through, and I can say as a track by graduate, no problem combining schools. Makes sense. But not everyone sees that. I have some issues with larger schools if it gets to a certain proportion of kids mm -hmm. in the school. But um, other than that. But the other, and, and if you look at Fairfield, I, mean, I know we've got Wallingford who does it, but if you look over the other direction on the highway, Fairfield did it. And, Went back yeah. to the old model, yes. so yeah. you know. It's, so we have, so we have on either side of us, we have examples of one that worked and one that didn't, and and part of it would be decided. Even when we when we earlier brought up the, the question of moving the sixth grade, we you know they kind of got sidetracked or whatever. But um, for space issues, they their population went up that much that they had to reopen that second school. Yeah, for a number of reasons. Right. Um, so yeah. It, it, but yeah, so, we, so either way, so but it, but it is it is determining what what best meets our needs and our town's needs and yeah. you know, but at least I mean I'm sure they do it over and over, but getting the answers to the direct and and so we're you know Blake and Brian would be a good source that he knows enough about the high schools that he can give us some basic information as to what's possible, what's not possible. If we thought we might even want to do it, he might even say you can't combine the schools because it just doesn't work. You know, I don't know, but he could talk to us because he's been in, in all the schools quite a bit and whether, you know, with the footprint and you said, you know, footing size or, or footprint size and classrooms and couldn't it, we reconfigure it? Do we have to go up? Do we have to? It's very, com it's, to me it was complicated. Yeah. And, you know, you constructed it, I constructed built spaces and, you know, major municipalities and the level of complication yeah. that this school facility formulary gets to it's yeah. stressful uh and i know we're talking about the physicality and that's very important but i i think we should also look at the educational value mm -hmm. are we going to get a, a better education for our our youth right. if we're combined and we're not have and we're having more classes and different subjects mm -hmm that we can't have now with two. And the, really, I think that has to come from Dr. Sunday 
there yeah. have been situations where certain classes that they're trying to offer at one high school they can't fill at the other and you know they're trying to reconfigure ways of making both sets of students um, participate so that makes sense I think what Amy brought up when it comes to like the other activities right like sports or band and music and all of those other things like does it make sense to have all that in you know one school so it's lots to and for paying attention it's happening naturally mm -hmm. right now with we have a combined band yeah yeah, yeah. combined swing right we yeah. have combined exactly. lacrosse yeah. this is they're doing it almost for us mm -hmm. you know the population is kind of pushing us to yeah. look yeah. at that yeah, when we're only getting 11 kids on a football uh, freshman team, that's not, that's not good. Because that's your senior class in four years, you know. Um, it's, it, from a sports standpoint, we could talk to the ADs to get there, you know. But I, I think we have some very good athletes in this town. The problem is half of them are up and down and half of them are strapped high. Mm -hmm. And guess what? You're not getting the best. So that well, even with the soccer program, a lot of now with all the new premier teams they have, yeah. a lot of these kids aren't even playing the high school level. They're they're playing premier and going straight to you know some of the elite premier leagues. And and it used to be we had middle school sports, but then all the travel teams, you know, through all the sports encompass that. So we no longer needed the middle school sports, and now we're at the high school. And, and I know there were a bunch of soccer kids who didn't play at the high school level. They went to the or the academy level and then right. well, so. because they know if they compete mm -hmm. on high school level they're gonna lose well, because they're all their their whole team is not good enough mm -hmm. to win mm -hmm. they're good enough mm -hmm. well, but their whole team is yeah it's just a higher level of training so well you're always going to have that yeah. and as you develop as you develop uh, new credit requirements you have more classrooms you wind up running the classes in the closets um, so it's got to be filtered in. You, you spoke to that, so did you, Ellen. Um, those are complex issues, and it takes a lot of people to figure that out and project that. Mm -hmm. I know when we went to when, when the, this study, I can't remember which one of the studies you had, but when we looked at the sixth grade and moving that, and that was done probably 10 years ago, but they had talked about reconfiguring the classrooms at flood. And, and that was how they made that space viable for moving the sixth grade up. But, you know, get to Alan's point, and, and your point is, can it be done in that school? And, and yeah. you know, can we redraw the lines to meet state guidelines and accomplish what we want with the space <coughs> that we have? And then we don't necessarily, if the structure is solid, then we don't necessarily need to build new. Great. Um, so I think that covered ABC. I think Mr. Allen is anxiously waiting to give his report on building needs. No, so just um, building needs, the next meeting is going to be Monday night. As I had put in the email, I have printouts 11 by 17 size. They are actually readable, so you can kind of see the dimensions and see what they're doing for the two solar projects. Um, it's good that the Board of Ed acted on them, uh, acted on them last night. I'm assuming that um, Town Council Building Needs Committee will, uh, will follow suit and those two projects will, um, will move forward. 